Coming up on Theater Talk. Early dating years, we would watch this show and go, and I would dream about being on this show one oh, day. So, so nice. Thank you so Before much. Before we even had cable. <laughs> <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and I am joined by my guest co-host, Elizabeth Vincentelli of The New York Times, The New Yorker, and Three on the Isle, the podcast we all adore. And we are so happy to be joined by Kristen Anderson Lopez and Robert Lopez, who are packing them in at their musical Frozen, now at the St. James Theater. They, of course, wrote the lyrics and songs for the mega hit movie. And now you've written how many more songs for this musical? Well, it depends how you count, but I think it's 12 to 14, depending if you count reprises and, uh, and new material with old melody. Elizabeth and I have been pondering Frozen, and we have some mm -hmm. questions for you, Lopez's. First, can we say how excited we are to be here? I've been, we've been watching you. You've, early dating years, we would watch this show and go, and I would dream about being on this show one oh, day. So, so nice. Thank you so Before much. Before we even had cable, she would have to sit, she would have <laughs> oh to lie God. down on her back. Her feet were somehow the antenna of the cable. It did, yes, it was not good. We had, I had to use sort of my leg as a conductor of <laughs> the waves out in Astoria to get our TV to not be too staticky. I, I, it sounds weird, and it was. Well, I hope you but got a better TV. All right. <laughs> <laughs> things, things have gotten better. Elizabeth? Well, the movie I think everybody knows, and a certain song everybody knows, but was it pretty obvious very early on that there would be a stage version? And when did they tell you, okay, now you guys have to go back and just crank out some more? We thought in our, in our deepest, fondest hopes that we would get to do it for Broadway because we had a lot more to say by the time the movie came out. And um, it, we weren't sure. And I we think there was- We used to joke often um, <laughs> if something fell on the floor and there were, there were at least 16 songs during the development of right. the Frozen movie that fell on the floor, and we would turn to each other and go, oh, well, we'll put it in the Broadway. That's polite talk for saying it, the song's out. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. <laughs> but you still held on to, to them. Sure, and, and sure. And we used none of it except for eight bars of oh. a little chant in the opening number um, of the cut songs from the movie. Yeah, all the new stuff was written expressly for the musical. How much was the movie influenced by what you had to say? The, how much was the story of that movie, the trajectory of that movie, and Yes, Let It Go, where I, I wondered so much, how was that coming from your centers? Well, I would say that every day we spoke with Jennifer Lee, Chris Buck, um, our music team, and the two of us on a little a little TV in Burbank every single day for several hours, I would say for about a year. And that was when, bit by bit by bit, we would talk about what Anna wants, who's Anna, mm. what Elsa wants, who's Elsa. Um, I think Jennifer Lee and Chris, I, I give them both incredible kudos for when we wrote Let It Go, Jennifer Lee was like, I love this song, and now we have to rewrite everything else in the movie uh, to make, to earn Let It Go. You're not always lucky enough to have generous Collaborators. Oh, but, but how smart it was. Oh, my God. Could you have imagined what Let It Go would become? Never yeah. in a million years. We were still writing for Elsa the villain at that moment. We wanted a moment where she uh, pivoted from the sort of buttoned-up, straight-laced kid with a secret uh, and became what we knew she had to become, which was the Snow Queen. And so we thought, oh, there's a place. That song will stay. But we tried to put in um, little hints of the dark side to which she eventually turned because at the end of the movie she was supposed to come down the mountain with an army of mutant snowmen and attack Arendelle. Oh my god, uh, I love this. We put, you know, let the storm rage on and all these The cold never bothered me anyway. Yeah. Slam. Like they there are traces of villain in Elsa, which which right. is interesting because in any powerful woman, in any three-dimensional woman, 
we all have pieces of ourselves that can get angry and vengeful. And that's one of the things that I think we love about Elsa and that we wanted to look at and go a little bit deeper in Act Two with she's the Broadway She's misunderstood. Show. She's misunderstood, but she's a three-dimensional person yes. who mm-hmm. is in a who has these powers that she can use for good or evil. That's why toddlers and six-year-olds love Elsa because she gives voice not only to to magic, but also she's a good, wonderful character who also says things like let the storm rage on and slams doors. I was curious about one of the new songs, Monster, which is really her big, who am I, what am I doing song. Did you guys decide, okay, she needs something at this point to explain what's going on, to verbalize it? How was that decided with like Jennifer Lee wrote the book also for the show? We met with Jen and um, uh, a few other people, Tom Schumacher included, and had a big uh, sort of confab about how we would lay out this new musical and what the new structure would demand, two acts. And uh, the songs don't stop near the end the way they do on the, in the movie because in the movie you have action. Mm-hmm. In the movie we had Hans and the men come up to the castle, he fought the big snow monster and then he confronted Elsa, there was a big action scene. But what we had to do was turn it into a song, Mm -hmm. tell the story through music and emotion. And in the movie, you get a lot of information through close up for all of Elsa's Mm -hmm. emotions. Mm -hmm. And um, when we were turning it into a Broadway musical, we had to replace close up with song. And at this point, we, if you really go into Elsa's head, and even back when we were working on the movie in 2013, when we explored what is really going on, she knows she's done something to her sister again. She knows people are coming from, for her. She knows her own people are, are dying in the winter. And the truth is, she would be having the thought at that moment, do I stop this whole thing by stopping myself? Mm-hmm. And she'd be looking at herself and wondering, am I a monster? Is this shame that I've had my whole life for who I am uh, real? Like, did they know when they said, conceal it? Did they know that I could do this much damage? And that's rich territory for a song. ask the question, and then we see her push through it and say, I don't know how I'm gonna solve this, but I am going to solve this. Her sister solves it. And uh, that's part of the story of empathy that we are excited about telling with this piece. Uh, Empathy that sisters can have for you. Well, and that you have the solution with the the sister and not with some boyfriend for Elsa. Never is she turning to a male to, to solve her problem. Or a female, because I yeah. have my theory about Elsa. <laughs> <laughs> Which I will say for Frozen 2. <laughs> Do you know, the, the, one of the cool things about developing the movie, um, and the same, same with, um, with the Broadway show too, because we had Jen Lee as well, was having two females in the creative room, in the creative space. Because so often, you know, and I felt this way when I was, you know, um, starting out, I, I thought, you know, m- men are, most, most writers are men. Writers are men. And um, when, when there was a woman around, there'd usually be one woman. And she'd be a lone voice saying, I, I kind of think this. And everyone would be like, okay, that's great. That's what she thinks. But having Kristen and Jen in the room, when, when the guys in the room would say, well, we have Hans, we have Anna, we have Elsa, maybe Anna and Elsa both like Hans. Maybe they fight about him. And then Jen, and then, then I would hold, like, I'd go, nope, 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 Thank nope, you. nope. <laughs> Guys, we've seen that story, oh, we know that horrifying. story. And then Jen being in the room, she would say, no, we're not doing that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That we, and the power of two women in a story room is, is what will bring us new stories and new perspectives. And it was, it's been amazing watching Bobby, I sort of tease him, I'm like, you're all woke now. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's been amazing yeah. watching Bobby's lens widen mm-hmm. from spending time in the story room with, with women. You guys have a real pop sensibility in, in your writing. Mm-hmm. And I was curious as to who, who do you listen to? Who, like what, who do you, do you have people that... Uh... Do you know, one of the people we started really listening to around the time of 
Frozen with Sarah Bareilles. Yeah. Oh, okay. She was um, seriously on our playlist back then. I was yeah. running in the park playing, because um, one of my favorite things to do is to just run in Prospect Park and listen to s girl singer-songwriters. Mm -hmm. So we were listening to Sarah Bareilles, we were listening to Amy Mann. We always loved Amy Mann. We were listening yeah. to Tori Amos, especially for Elsa. Oh, okay. um, we were trying to, we knew that she was not going to be the the Disney princess who was like, oh, the sun is shining today. <laughs> right. Like we knew it, that she was going to have a rock and roll edge to her, mm -hmm. and um, and yet you can't go so far that she's all groove based. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting with pop songs and and sometimes why pop writers can have a hard time bridging to. Broadway mm -hmm. is that everything is about groove and then you can't hear the lyrics and in Broadway you can only hear the lyrics once. Mm -hmm. um, the audience, especially before the cast album is released, which usually right. is two to three months after the first preview has started. Um, and so your show needs to survive on somebody sitting in the dark understanding every every objective, every choice that's made with one listen to the lyric. And if you're competing with like a growling guitar right. and a drum groove, um, it can be very hard. When things repeat on Broadway, they have to grow and intensify and climb, mm -hmm. whereas in pop, repetition is very, it's important for it to kind of, for things to repeat exactly. And I think, Bobby, of your, of your hits before uh, Frozen that you had Avenue Q and then the, the wonderful Book of Mormon that you, you already were grappling very successfully with that problem. Uh. To me that, you know, that you, you had some groove, but you, ha you had memorable lyrics and songs that we were listening to and getting the first time. Now, before we go, I, I consulted my favorite Frozen fans, my nieces, Emma, Kate, and Audrey, and they had some questions for you, so I said I would ask them. Oh, okay. good. They gave me some good ones. Did you think Frozen would become this popular? We would, when we were doing the the show, we just wanted it to be baseline good. You mean the movie? It wasn't yeah. oh, in the movie. The movie yes. Movie. <laughs> we were fighting to um, to take something that didn't work and make it basically work. And uh, we thought we were going down. We thought <laughs> this was it. Uh, this is the first really big job we had done together. Um, and I was like, well, that's the end of this collaboration. Because um, there were some really bad screenings. And, and that's also part of the process of these Disney movies is they take a long time. They're so huge and they involve so many moving yeah, parts yeah. that sometimes you can have the right ending, but to just get there the wrong way. Uh -huh. and. You know, things like Elsa had spiky blue hair and froze her sister's heart and kidnapped her from her own wedding and tried to kill the city of Arendelle. Like, that was one of the versions. We're in a similar place in Frozen 2 right now, and so it's good to talk about this and remember, <laughs> you know, you've, you've got certain things that are working great and other things where you're like, we really need to go deeper. What, what, what stage is Frozen to what kind of? Oh, we're going into our second screening. Something like that. Um, oh wow! Okay, next, so pretty, but uh, you get a. You it's get all in. Um, it's like uh, just the black and white drawings mm -hmm. right, phase right now. There's no animation yet. There's, it's still it's still in the birthing. And you know we're still sitting around the table, saying, asking questions like, what can we use Frozen? How can we use the Frozen franchise to make the world a better place? <laughs> and what what do we, what does the world need to hear from Anna and Elsa? And what do we have to contribute to that? Those we're still asking those giant questions. <laughs> and what's the budget of this production? We don't know. They don't. Oh, you don't talk well, about well, money. We, we, we Was that one of your niece's questions? Yes. No. It is. I'm I can, a it's right I'm there. A don't but, my, worry but I'm going to end. But I'm going to end with one of my niece's <laughs> niece, uh, wonderful question. How do you like doing interviews? I love them. Yeah, I think I'll do another one. That's a good ending. Alas, we've run out of time. Elizabeth, what a pleasure to have you oh, here. Oh, it was a pleasure to be here. With Thank you. Robert and Christian Anderson Lopez. Come back for the next one, please. Yes, please. Am I just a monster in a cage? with me is my utterly delightful <laughs> co-host, actor Julie Halston. We call you an actor now, Julie That's Halston. right. That's it's right. Very grand. I'm happy to be here. Tony season has just begun, and the theater community begins the countdown to the ceremony on June 10th when the winners will be announced. 
The Tony Awards are managed by two organizations, the American Theater Wing, led by Heather Hitchens, and the Broadway League, which is led by its muscle and president, Charlotte St. Martin. Charlotte is the president of the organization since, well, you began there in 2006, and then you became the president in, what, 2015, right? That's correct. That's right. Tell us a little bit about the Broadway League. Well, the Broadway League is made up of the people who make Broadway. Yep. The producers, the theater owners, the general managers, and then the presenters who take these fabulous shows and present them around our country in 200 venues and 150 cities. And then Obviously, we have international presence. Uh, we're not controlling that, but our members are. So Charlotte, key programs of the Broadway League include Kids Night on Broadway, The Jimmy, Stars in the Alley, Internet Broadway Database, Broadway.org, Spotlight and Broadway, the Commercial Theater Institute, the Theater Development Fund, and Broadway Bridges, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And Charlotte St. Martin, how do you manage all that? We manage it with a village. We have an incredible staff, and I'm so proud of our members because over 40% of our members participate in a committee or a task force. So they're the ones that help us make it happen. So Julie and I want to know yeah. more about what you do in well, Tony season. Tony season, which is obviously it's it's almost like a you know the thoroughbreds race horses. What's the best part of it and the worst part of it for? the Broadway League? Well, certainly the best part is you get to acknowledge the outstanding work that's been done by so many people. Right. And there's something very special about that. At any given time, we'll have over 125 nominees. So you know these people that give their life to this industry yes. are being acknowledged. The worst part is you know what went into all of those and not everyone can win. Right. So other than also you know, in the month of April doing 20 openings and all that goes with that, uh, which I wouldn't call punishment, but it is grueling. How does the Broadway League work with the production of the actual show? The League, in, it, in conjunction with The Wing and my partner Heather and I, we work very closely with the television producers okay. and the members. And certainly we don't produce the show, those creative people who've won so many Emmys for the Tonys right. do that. But we certainly talk about host, we talk about uh, the other things, the non-particular show-driven activities. Right. We talk about the awards, the presenters. So we're involved, but we don't lead it. And do you right. have veto power? On a few things. <laughs> we don't tell what we veto. All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I watch what you all do and I think, how does she do it? How does she keep her stamina up to do this all? Well, I grew up in the hotel business, uh -huh. which is a 24-7, and it was 24-7 before people even used that, for, that term. I mean, they're 80-hour weeks, so I obviously built up my stamina to prepare myself for Broadway. How did you get from the hotel business into the Broadway League? Well, in the hotel business, I was literally known as Broadway Charlotte. I was with a major hotel to begin, uh -huh. and we held parties for two to 5,000. I always hired Broadway entertainers. And so when this position was being searched, three different people recommended me, and they said, no one loves Broadway more than Charlotte, and she puts a lot of it on in her hotels and for the industry. So it all happened, and I'm the luckiest person in the world that I got to take my avocation and make it my vocation. What I find fascinating, because I actually was reading about your love of the theater, and, um, but you know, a lot of people who get into these positions, either behind the scenes or even in a corporate set setting, you know, they go, well, I wanted to be an actress at one time, or I had a dance class. Or that was not your story. You just happened to love the theater. Was this something your parents inspired in you or you just somehow you saw your first show and said, oh my gosh, I love this? Well, my mother did love Broadway and uh -huh. we used to attend all of the Dallas Summer Musicals offerings. Oh. And as a young woman, we would save up to go get to do that. And then my first boyfriend was played the king in The King and I and it was... <laughs> 
<laughs> love at first sight, both for him and for the, uh, the industry. And it just stuck with me. I've loved it forever. One of the important projects you're doing now at the Broadway League is Broadway Bridges. Can you tell us about that? Yes, you're going to talk about my passion now, in addition to Broadway. Um, the program, the goal is to have every high school student in New York City see a Broadway show before they graduate. Mm -hmm. And it's been a dream of mine since literally my second year in the league. And then uh, we applied for a couple of grants from the Subdistrict Arts Council, uh, were a finalist, did not get it, and my partner, Tori Bailey from the Theater Development Fund, sure. looked at me and she said, we cannot let this go. Yeah. It should be the inalienable right of every New Yorker to see a Broadway show. And that I grabbed a hold of that, we grabbed a hold of that, put a committee together and started the program. We just finished our first year. We brought 7,500 students. By the end of next year, we will have brought 25,000 students. So as wow. we build up, we will hopefully be taking over 70,000 students to see a Broadway show in one year. How do you reach out year. to them? How do you reach out to these kids? We work very closely with the Department of Education mm -hmm. and the two great gentlemen uh, that manage the theater uh, works for uh, the DOE and Peter Avery and Paul King work very closely with us in helping us get to the teachers. We now are, of course, building up relationships with them. Right. And after each part of the season, because we do a summer and a, a winter program, and after each of those, we actually meet with the teachers, say, okay, how can we improve this? Oh, right. uh, we're very fortunate that our members jumped right on board. And for those uh, shows that are appropriate, for teenagers in high school, almost all of them participate in the program. Now, I would be remiss, Charlotte, if I didn't ask you about making theater more accessible to adults, because I get a lot of letters from people about ticket prices. And in fact, yesterday, I got a letter from one of the Friends of Theater Talk, Robert Cohen, and he said that he went to buy a ticket for a big hit, not Hamilton, but another big hit, in, and he wanted a ticket for July, and they said, well, you can have a premium seat in row Q for $300. And he wrote and said, why must row Q mm. be a premium seat? Why is it that it has to be so expensive even for the back of the, of the house? The truth is, yeah. on any given day, you can get a good seat to a great Broadway show for under $100. And the average ticket price goes from 100 to 110, and there are anywhere from 30 to 40 shows playing at any given time. So they can all be $300. But you can't get that hit. You can't get that hit right now, but there, every right. show gets to a point that they're available. And anybody that tells me Phantom isn't as great today as it was 30 years ago when it opened doesn't know how wrong they are. We are a commercial business. We're there to make a profit. If we don't make a profit, there won't be more Hamiltons. There won't be more Hello Dollies. When the shows are hot, the producers have to make hay when the sun shines. That said, any given day, you can get tickets 59, 69, 79. And this season to date, which is almost over, we're at 88% of our seats occupied. So a lot of people are getting a well-priced ticket. Now, you are a woman running this gigantic, I said you're the muscle, you really are running this gigantic Broadway league. And we're in the time of, you know, women are, are reasserting their, their uh, respect issues, but you've been a powerful force for quite some time. But did you ever find that there were any handicaps in you being a woman and trying to manage people and get people to accommodate your will? 40 years ago, absolutely. Yes, I probably had to work harder and longer to get that opportunity, but I did get it. I did prove myself, and therefore I got the opportunity. I would say, since I've been on Broadway, they have done nothing but show me enormous respect and actually were hopeful that I could help uh, get rid of any perception that we don't treat women well. Can we treat women better? Of course. Can every business treat women better? Of course. But 
I don't have that problem at the Broadway League. I'll bet you're tough. Are you tough? I have strong will. Good. And am persistent. Yes. Which I think helps. What would be your biggest piece of advice for an aspiring young Charlotte St. Martin? The most important thing a young person moving into any field can do is listen to what's going on around them. Ask the right questions and then not be afraid to take any job and to volunteer for many things. That's certainly how I personally got ahead. I did my job and I said, all right, what else can I do? How else can I make a difference? And it trained me in so many areas that I knew nothing about, which prepared me for that next promotion. And I think that's the single best piece of advice for a young person because so many of them, they graduate and they think they should start off as my boss. Right. You know, <laughs> and I right. respect that, that drive and energy, but the reality is experience does count. Charlotte St. Martin, thank you so much for coming to Theater Talk. We are looking forward to the Tony Awards and you will, you will be on the broadcast, I hope. Well, they usually take a quick glimpse of Heather and I. Oh. Uh, we <laughs> welcome the audience before the broadcast begins which is the best part. Very good. All right, so see you around there in Tony season. Thank you, and thank you for keeping up our fabulous industry in the eyes of the world. Thank you. Thank well. you. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you. <laughs>